thanks uh, the organizers for uh, calling us for the TEDx Embracing Technology uh, Forum today. Uh, to introduce myself, uh, I'm Venkat. I uh, head the company. For about uh, 14 years, I was in the IT industry. I was a typical TAM ramp. I grew up in Mylapur, uh, went on to IIT uh, with dreams of uh, becoming, you know, getting a green card and settling down in America. Went on, finished my computer science there. But then uh, you know, things happen. <coughs> and then uh, now I am selling vegetables. And most people don't know me or definitely wouldn't have called me because I was a vice president in some IT company. But after I started selling vegetables, I've been getting calls for most of the conferences to talk about my experiences. So that's a little bit to uh, give you a little uh, freshener that uh, when you try to do something different with your life, usually you do get the recognition, even though things might be a little uh, difficult initially. OK, so a lot of you might already know about agriculture. Everybody knows about the problems. Every you trip and fall, somebody always says, like, yeah, I know the problem about agriculture. There are too many middlemen, or you know, the government is not doing enough and all that. So in general, yes, we all know that there are too many, especially in India, that are, uh, things have not changed for over thousands of years. It's a very, very old industry. Uh, literally, like, you know, 500 million people have been doing it for the last 5,000 years. Uh, but one very interesting side of agriculture, when we came forward, <coughs> especially me, my wife, uh, Shivali, uh, who's the partner and uh, colleague who is now controlling me from the other side, as usual. So one, since we were not from the agriculture industry, we started seeing things uh, from uh, kind of out-of-box kind of situation. We, we, first uh, day in, we walked out and said, OK, where is the data? How many people are there? What are they growing? We realized that fundamentally there is not much data at all about what the farmers are growing, uh, uh, what is the price they want, or where are they coming and selling these stuff. Similarly, we also did not know too much about the demand side. What are people eating? Uh, what are the hotels buying? What quality do they want? So every day, it's a kind of a ad hoc situation. People were going to the Monday and trying to figure out you know, what is available for the day and making out your, uh, what's happening in the kitchen. So we realized that data fundamentally itself is missing in this industry. So that is one of the biggest reasons why this industry is continuously ch facing a lot of challenges every single day. And of course, a lot of solutions have been proposed. You know. Uh, even my neighborhood uncle has a thousand solutions of how to fix the agricultural crisis. But the problem is nobody steps forward because uh, 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 everybody is kind of uh, uh, fear. There's a, there's a sudden fear of, you know, somebody will do something to you if you start doing something. There's always this thing floating around that there are a lot of mafia in this industry and all that. So uh, uh, strangely, after three or four years of working, I think the biggest mafia in this industry today is probably us because uh, the kind of scale we have done <laughs> or the kind of work we have done in the last three to four years, the kind of people we have touched, uh, we have been able to see that uh, it's a kind of a blind man and the elephant kind of syndrome, because everybody sees uh, the problem from their own perspectives. Uh, people from the research side or the college side, they see that, OK, maybe if we come up with a different variety of rice or a different variety of tomato, magically this solution will solve. Or from the government side, they think, like, OK, we'll throw some money, call some FDI, you know, have some foreign direct investment, and automatically this solution will get solved. But the problem is everybody is looking at it from different perspectives. A lot of the time, these solutions are overlapping or sometimes mutually contradictive, which is why we have not really seen the elephant really get up and start doing anything dramatic. <coughs> and another biggest problem is, of course, marketing. Uh, you go to any village in India, you'll see Coca-Cola, you'll see Pepsi, you'll see all the uh, 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 your toothpaste and shampoos. Everything is very, uh, very nicely driven. But whereas if you see a farmer from Virupuram or uh, Tanjavur trying to sell something to even a nearby town, the challenges are extremely high. Very simple, because there are not too many educated people working. The, the, the biggest cola companies, the FMCG companies, have the brightest of uh, engineers and MBAs working for them, planning things out. Whereas the poor farmer does not have too many educated people helping him out. So everything he has to do it himself. These are some of the challenges we saw. Uh, when we started this company itself, or uh, when we go out and talk about uh, these things, a lot of people, obviously, like in the first thing, they say it will not work. Uh, one of the biggest things which we are always being told is, okay, villagers are illiterate, they do not understand technology, they will not be able to use it. Once again, uh, it's, it's a very, very wrong assumption. First of all, uh, you would have seen statistics that almost 800 million mobile phones are already active, which means literally everybody from your neighborhood Aya to rickshawalas to farmers actually has a mobile phone, which is a small computer by itself, because you can talk, you can send SMSs, you can convey data uh, uh, with that. Second big myth is people are... Not, uh, confusing between intelligence versus literacy. Okay, yes, farmers are illiterate to a large extent. They may not have 
across uh, high school, but we see that our interactions, they're extremely brilliant because most of the things that you have to do in a village, they have to do it by themselves. They do not have too many people to help them out. And also the kind of knowledge they have gained is a very collective wisdom across so many people. Whereas if you see the newspapers nowadays, uh, uh, very strangely, just across the road, an IIT, somebody committed suicide about a couple of weeks ago. A, a, a student, uh, simply because, not because of pressures and studies, because his girlfriend said, uh, you know, I don't like you, and he commits suicide. Uh, and then we see people in engineering schools and other schools committing ragging and murdering somebody. And then we see on the ECR road every single day, people drunk, college students drunk, and committing accidents. So is this something intelligent? Is this what an intelligent community would do? Definitely not. A farmer committing suicide, we can understand because of certain pressures. But a student committing suicide for some vague reason like that, because we even saw that you know, somebody changes the status message in Facebook and somebody commits suicide. So that is uh, the kind of status we are seeing. So please be aware that you know, people in the villages are much smarter than doing things like that. <clears throat> Second is a myth which you often come across is farmers are poor, and they will not be able to afford any services which are involving technology, which, which again is wrong. Because most of the time, if there is a service which they like, they do pay for it. You would have seen that most of the mobile phones, which even the auto wallas and uh, you know, your milk wallas have, they buy it out of their own uh, pocket money. They buy it out of their own incomes. The government is not subsidizing mobile phones. The government is not subsidizing any of the plans. And uh, for example, what you and me pay for, say, uh, 333 full talk time is the same amount which uh, they are also paying. Because they see the value in the business which they see, and they can communicate. So they're not expecting uh, any freebies in those kind of things. Whereas if there is no sense to a certain commodity, then they expect things to be free. But most of the cases we have seen that if you do add a certain value to their lives, they are willing to pay for it. <clears throat> Let's look at some of the interesting ways technology has changed the way the, the common arm army of India currently works. A lot of you uh, might not recollect, but you know, 10 or 15 years ago, if you have to book a train ticket, it was a horrendous experience. You have to stand, you have to go to a train station, stand there for 10 or 15 minutes, and wait in a queue before you could get your ticket. Nowadays, gone are the days. IRCTC has taken as a government body, which has uh, uh, completely changed the way train ticket booking is uh, being done. And uh, as of today, they are even venturing into airline ticket booking. So uh, similarly, like you know, if you have to reach out to any business, if you have to book a hall, or if you have to find a plumber or something, there are a lot of websites today, a lot of uh, services today which are easily available. And gone are the days which you have to be uh, harassed by an auto driver. You can call a call taxi, and usually they come and pick you up and drop you wherever they want to. They don't charge extra. They usually go by the meter. So these are some things where technology has uh, you know, slowly started helping people uh, 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 who have been facing problems for so many years. But uh, once again, a lot of these have been in the urban areas. We have not seen much of these effect of technology in the rural areas. So our idea has always been, can we take some of these business models, which are quite successful, which are quite simple, they work using very simple things like phones or mobile phones or SMS, and try and see if the agriculture industry can be made better using these technologies. <clears throat> the solution which, uh, of course, uh, which has been tried out most of the time has been uh, quite westernized. Like, for example, a lot of people have said, you know, try cold storages. Cold storages technically is not a very Indian solution, because fundamentally you'll see that every day we have two or three hours of power kit. And on every week for maintenance, uh, literally the whole day there is no power. Just imagine a cold storage with this 10 crores of investment and you put your uh, vegetables and then there is no power. So most of the time they subsidize the cold storage. They do not subsidize the electricity or even availability of the electricity. And second, most of these storage solutions are very Western concepts because there the average temperature even in summer is usually 15 to 20 degrees. Here the minimum temperature in summer is at least 25 to 30 degrees. So there is a huge amount of uh, change. And second, even to run a cold storage, it's not like a fridge, you just put everything inside and you expect everything to be nice. So it once again requires a lot of education to do. So we feel that you know some of the simpler technologies, for example, the Dabawalas, a lot of you might have been familiar with the Mumbai Dabawalas, which are a Six Sigma rated system which has been running for over 150 years. Interestingly, it is run by people who are completely illiterate, over 55 years old, and they're running one of the world's best supply chain or distribution system, simply because the process which they're using is very, very grounded in India. They use train systems which are extremely efficient in Bombay, and uh, a cost system which is which works very, very efficiently even for a slum, slum, uh, a slum dweller all the way to, a, 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 say, a star hotel. And similarly, there are a lot of concepts, like, for example, Fab India. They have done a fantastic work with the textile and weavers community. And then eBay has done a fantastic way by with person-to-person -person, 
uh, uh, commerce can be done using a certain platform. So what we have done is basically combine a lot of these business models and come up with something called as eFarm Direct. <clears throat> On the ground level, some of the technology uh, interventions we have done is, for example, weighing machine. Uh, most farmers, if you've seen, uh, if you've, any of you have experience going to a Monday or a warehouse, you'll see that they still use just bags of, uh, they, they count in bags. You, you, you buy onions in bags. You buy uh, kirei or spinach in bundles. They talk in a very strange uh, uh, in units. And very strangely, for thousands of years, we have not even standardized basic things like kilos or grams or you know, certain crates. And these are some things which we saw was extremely lacking, without which you can't even do business. And uh, simple things like grading. Most of the time, a farmer mixes up everything because they usually don't have labor to sort out things. And so we started saying, no, there are different ways. If you walk into a shop, you don't just buy a, a free size shirt and try to fit yourself in. Everybody has a certain size. And that way, if you start sorting it, you will be able to correctly match a certain requirement, like, for example, a Star Hotel or a Sangeeta Hotel or a Saravana Bhavan or a roadside Daba. They all need re different requirements. You can't just have one size fit all kind of approach. And of course, like you know, simple solutions like mobile phones with a call center, a rural call center, where somebody speaks their own local language, you know, that can very easily connect with any of the villages rather than trying to, uh, sometimes people have tried too much. Like for example, trying to put a website in front of a farmer probably is the wrong idea. But if you put a call center in front of a farmer, yes, the data finally comes through voice and somebody can actually translate it. So it also provides employment for a lot of uh, rural people and rural youth. <clears throat> so what we have basically done is remove this concept of a middleman and try and connect the chain. Because once you connect the chain, you realize that a far everybody is buying or selling something. A farmer is buying something like seeds or fertilizers. He's selling something to the market. Somebody is buying something, converting it into a juice or a, a jam, and selling something it back to somebody else. So once the data about all of these players are available in a common area, it's easy for all of them to do business. So let's introduce eFarm Direct. So we do work on the ground uh, layer also, where we physically move things around. So very recently, we have launched eFarm Direct, which is in very simple way, four key things which we see as a gap is one, a farmer connecting to a buyer, farmer connecting to his suppliers, basically what he buys, like seeds and fertilizers, a farmer connecting to a transporter, because a lot of the times he has to uh, pay two times to a transport lorry, because like sometimes the lorry comes back empty, back to his trip. So every time you pay for a tomato or an onion, you'll just realize that 25 to 30% goes to the, the lorry driver because he, he has to charge back empty uh, going back to the village. And the fourth problem, of course, is laborers. So we have just said, okay, if all the data is available of these players on a, on a common portal and the farmer can access it using SMS or, or a voice or, a, or, a, or, a, or a, you know, a call center, it is easy for him to do business. So we'll do a brief demonstration of the uh, eFarm Direct uh, portal to give you a better understanding of uh, what it works. Let me just switch over. Portal. Just refresh it one more time. As once it comes up, hopefully, is you'll see uh, we're trying to give a very simple feel of uh, a Google like search uh, feature, which basically where you can go and search for, suppose if you are a farmer and you're trying to search for a buyer, or if you're a buyer trying to search for farmers, I hope the net connection. So basically what we have done is like, you know, uh, take the data of all the farmers and buyers, like, you know, there's a team which is going out meeting all the hotels and caterers. There's a team which is going out and meeting all the farmers uh, uh, through our NGO partners and all. We are collecting all the data, putting it online. And similarly, the suppliers, like people who are seed companies or uh, you know, fertilizer companies. So th what is that they are growing? What is that they are selling? And uh, slowly we want to get into the transport uh, segment as well. So all the lorries which are, uh, which are moving from, say, Chennai to Bangalore to Trichy or Madurai. So just like how fast track or any of these cab services work. So the lorries can also be booked more easily. So the basic fundamental thing is, of course, the data being available on a, on a, on a ready to uh, see format. So uh, once the site comes up, or you know, actually the site is active. So in case you get a chance, you can go and check it out on efarmdirect.com. And uh, thanks. So basically, uh, for example, let's search for a mango farmer. If you start typing mango, it will even show you options like, you know, We've done the same kind of uh, IntelliSense kind of search as Google does. So these are different varieties, because there are thousands of varieties of uh, products which we have. So you can even search for a particular variety, and it'll start showing the farmers who are growing this across India. And uh, you can sort it based on the person, or the district, or the state, or when it is available. Like you know, uh, sometimes with vegetable products and all that, it's not that the farmer is growing this all through the year. 
is usually in a particular season, say in, in summer or spring or autumn or something like that. So this is, for example, a mango farmer who has different varieties of mango. You can very clearly see when it is available. What is the price they are expecting? Because this is, again, something which you have been training farmers. Like, if you are the producer, you have to initiate a price. Most of the time, they expect the government to set the price or the broker to set the price, which is all very strange things about the agri-industry. So we have been training the farmers. We conduct training programs for them, like how to set your own price and how to set your own margin, what to expect, at a, uh, what is the cost of production of a, of a mango. These are some things which, which is more business-like. And uh, so that way, like, you know, even if somebody calls, the person actually has the, uh, uh, something uh, to uh, fall back on, like something to negotiate on and say, no, I do need 15 rupees a kg for uh, a minimum of my uh, uh, mango uh, production. So similarly, the buyers, like for example, a farmer can either call the call center or they could even go online or some of their uh, friends or colleagues or even their sons and daughters nowadays are all educated. So they can go and search. For example, if uh, there's a tomato farmer, and sometimes, like, you know, even if they specifically want to find organic bias, because another big challenge nowadays is, like, a lot of people, there's a lot of demand for organic, but the number of farmers who are doing this is very, very rare. It is kind of dwindling. So we have also said, like, you know, it is much more, it's once again a data field. So if, if there is an organic buyer and an organic farmer, by matching them correctly, that is the right way to kind of fetch the right price for them. So that way, like, we also list, similarly from the buyer side, how much are they buying, what quantity, what grade, what specification. That way, like, the matching is a lot more uh, uh, clear and specific. So uh, uh, to uh, come back to the, uh, the presentation, so basically that's uh, what we have launched, and we are slowly expanding to other areas. We are also going to add a lot more features in terms of uh, search facilities and also ratings so that you can uh, rate the uh, farmer and the buyer so that, like, you know, it becomes more and more easier to do business in the agri-industry. So that is basically what we are trying to do. And in this effort, we are also trying to reach out to a lot of uh, students because we feel that fundamentally educated people coming back to the industry is going to be one of the uh, greatest step forward. Uh, because like when you have a lot of youth and a lot of energy inside, we can make the impossible possible. So a lot of people have always kept saying, like agriculture industry is not in uh, good shape and all that. And uh, fundamentally, we feel that it's all a question of you know, how you look at it. You, know, you, you have a knife if in the hands of a doctor. It can be used for surgery. If in the hands of a thief, you can kill somebody. In the hands of a barber, you can shave. So uh, that way, technology as such is a tool. So how we use it, for what purpose we use it, is it for a mission critical thing or just to play games or you know, just have uh, Facebook uh, friends or chatting along all day? All of this is good. But uh, do look at technology as a tool which can be effectively used to start solving problems and sol start solving our own problems instead of working for somebody else. Start looking at our own problems right around here in India. I think a uh, lot of you youngsters will find a lot of interesting career and a lot of interesting fun to uh, do along with it. Thank you so much.